Hello, Tanya Laird here, and welcome to part one of lecture 10 of ENGR 231 Engineering Statics. In this part of the lecture, we are going to explore uh, the zero force member condition uh, for trusses. And we're going to explore this as a continuation on the method of joints that we saw previously. Most of this lecture is going to be looking at analyzing uh, trusses using the method of joints, but we're going to start in part one with just a discussion of the zero force member condition. So truss zero force members. And uh, trust zero force members, I, want, I like to discuss this after we look at the method of joints and after you have some experience working with it and practicing it because uh, truthfully, that or in, at a basic level, the zero force member condition comes directly out of joint equilibrium. So if you remember back to our discussions of, of uh, the method of joints, when you have a trust member, uh, a trust member of course is one that has uh, straight members connected by pin joints with no loads applied between the joints, only loads applied at the joints. Uh, but at a particular joint, you're going to have a variety of members coming into that joint. And let's say this is a, a joint A we are analyzing, and I'm, I'm talking about, I'm going to look at this uh, first of all in a very generic form. Let's say we have a joint A here. If I want to analyze the forces in this joint, what I would do is I would apply a, a summation of forces about joint A. I would look at the summation of forces in the x direction and a summation of forces in the y direction. And then using this in the equations of static equilibrium, I would look at all of the, the x components going into that joint for each of the member forces, all of the y components for each of the forces going into that joint, and then using that and, uh, and forces on other joints or equations from other joints, I can then solve for all of the forces in a truss, assuming of course that it is statically determinate. Now, uh, that's all well and good, but what I want to go on, so, so that's a bit of a review with, uh, of what the method of joints is, but the zero force member condition comes uh, from a very particular case uh, of uh, joint forces, or, or I should say of joint uh, force and member relationships. So a zero force member, uh, let's just say this, let me state it like this. Uh, if a joint has One, two, and only two, uh, maybe let's say, uh, perhaps we should say uh, no more than three members coming into the joint, uh, coming into a joint. I'm going to sort of state this as an if-then type argument. If a truss, if a joint has no more than three members uh, coming into it, and uh, two, uh, two of those members are collinear, and three. Uh, no non-collinear forces are present, or any uh, any forces present on the joint. On the joint are also collinear with these two members. Oh, uh, with these two members. So if you have a joint that satisfies these uh, conditions, no more than three members coming into uh, coming into it, and two of the members are collinear, and any forces present on the joint are also collinear with these two members, then, uh, maybe so, and, and, then, the third member will have a force of zero. The third member will have no, will carry no load or will have no force running through it. So uh, this is perhaps a more rigorous way of expressing this, but it's it, this is one of those things that's best demonstrated by example. 
Um, and also a caveat here, not really a caveat, but a, a, a elaboration. If a member uh, meets the zero force condition at either end, a zero force condition on either end, then it has zero load period. Has zero force throughout. So let me show you an example of how, of how this could occur. Let's say we have. Let's start with the simplest uh, case of a zero force member first, or a zero force member condition. The simplest case would be where you simply have uh, three members, two collinear. So let's say we have three members, and maybe I just have a joint, oh, maybe this is joint A here, and then around it, let me go write that a little bit bigger, and then around it I have joint B, uh, joint C, and then off at some angle theta, uh, joint D, here, at some theta, some theta that's not zero. So we're ignoring a trivial case where theta is non-zero, or where theta is zero. So uh, if we look at this from the point of view of static equilibrium, we will have join A. And then uh, let's look at the forces here. Again, I'm, I am analyzing this from the point of view of the method of joints. Uh, so uh, let's I would have FAC over here. And then I would have FBD, or FAB, I should say. And then some FAD. And FAD would be at some angle theta. Now, and FA, again, FAD would be at some angle theta. Now, um, here's the key. Now, I am, I am drawing this as if this is horizontal. So um, I actually should probably state AB and AC are collinear. In other words, they're in a straight line. Now, I am drawing this with AB and AC along the horizontal plane, but that ultimately doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether these are arranged like this, because if we remember from a lot of our previous discussions, like let's say you had the three members like this, uh, B, A, C here, because if you remember from prior discussions, it doesn't matter what the exact uh, axis is, because we can always take a, if you remember from previous lectures, what we have often done is take in equilibrium about a convenient set of axes. So uh, even, if the, even if the joints were arranged like this at an angle, I could then take equilibrium about a uh, perpendicular and parallel set of axes. I could basically use a local set of axes, an x-axis here and a y-axis here, and this still would maintain equilibrium. Again, because if something is going to be in equilibrium, uh, ultimately the choice of axis is largely arbitrary. I can take equilibrium about any set of parallel, uh, sorry, perpendicular axes. And again, uh, as, I've said, as I've said before, and I'd like to state, uh, the choice of axes is purely arbitrary. That's just our way of understanding the, the world or our way of understanding a structure. Nature is going to do what nature is going to do, regardless of what we choose to define an, an axis by. And so there may be more convenient axes than others. And if something's going to be in equilibrium, it must be in equilibrium about any chosen set of axes. Now, even if this was written like this, you could get the same result by doing a uh, set of axes with the x like this and the y like this, but this just is more convenient and makes the math a little bit simpler. Okay. But anyway, look what happens if we... Uh, so uh, that's just an explanation of why I can get away with using a local set of axes like this with the, the, with the y on the vertical here and the x on the horizontal. If I do a sum of summation of forces about x, well, I just get negative FAB uh, plus FAC uh, plus FAD times the cosine of theta. Now that really doesn't help us very much and doesn't really tell us anything. However, look what happens when I do a summation of forces in the y direction. Suddenly things get interesting. I will have FAD times the sine of theta and nothing else. See, 
FAB here and FAC are basically purely horizontally or purely horizontal. And so they do not have any vertical component along my ax along my chosen set of axes. So there is nothing uh, to counteract uh, this force in FAD. And this still must equal zero. And just like when we looked at two force members or two force bodies, as long as we're rejecting the trivial case where theta is equal to zero, FAD must equal zero. FAD simply must equal zero. So um, again, FAD is going to equal zero, and as long as there is no, as long as there are only two members here and no, and and, and they are collinear, there will be no force carried by FD. So what's interesting about this, or what's cool about this, is that you can basically eliminate members in a truss when you're solving for member forces. So if you have a truss that is arranged like this, for example. And uh, let's say you have a truss like this. This would be a very interesting one. Let's say I have a truss that is arranged like this. Well, um, actually, I, I, maybe I don't want to do cascading members right just yet. So maybe I'll just uh, say maybe something like that with another force here for now. So if you had a member We'll get to cascading uh, members later, when I, but we'll discuss that in a bit. So let's say you had this truss here. And looking, look, let's consider this here, this joint here. At this particular joint, I have uh, three members, uh, so I do meet this condition. I have three members, and this member here and this member here are collinear, but this member here is, is the... Uh, is not collinear with this one and this one. And that means that because we just have three members coming together at a joint and with only one not being collinear and no other forces applied on this joint, then this member must have zero force in it. This member will not carry any load whatsoever. And note, uh, this is a zero force member regardless of what's going, in, going on at the other end. So this member here does not meet the zero force condition on this end, but that doesn't matter. A truss member, as we've learned previously, is only capable of, of supporting a single load. And if one end of it uh, fixes that load at zero, the rest of the member must have zero force in it, period. The rest must have zero force, period. Okay, so that's one case. And another uh, case that's worth considering is if there is uh, three members uh, and a collinear load. Uh, or maybe I should say uh, two collinear and one collinear load. So this is the one case where you can get away with having um, a load on a zero force member while still at, uh, on that joint where that the zero force member condition is created and also still having a zero force member present. So for example, let's say you have this kind of thing here where you have a member, a member here, a member here, and then another member off at some angle. Oh, jumped ahead, some off at some angle. Well, if you have a force that is actually in line with one of these members or with the collinear set. Let's say you have some force here. Well, in this case, when you do a balance of forces along this uh, local axis here, uh, this force will not be present in the local y axis because I would have a, a local y axis. Basically, my I could analyze this with my local x axis here and my local y axis here. And the local x-axis, uh, that force would be entirely in the local x-axis, along with this member and this member. But the uh, the collinear, this uh, member here that has the y component would not have any force resisting it. So uh, then let's talk about cases where you won't have the zero force member condition. Uh, let's look at this. And that, the big one, is where you're going to have a load that is not collinear. A uh, non collinear load, zero force condition not met.
So for example, let's say we have a joint uh, that's like this, here, here, and I'll go back up here. Maybe I'll just give these uh, similar names. Let's say this is joint A, and then we have FAB. Oh, let's just, actually, you know what? Let me, um, ah, let me make these actual joints. Let's draw this out proper, um, like this. Let's call this joint B, joint C, and a uh, set, another collinear member here, collinear with AB, uh, a joint D. But I'm going to apply a, a single force now. But a force that is not collinear with a BA and a, or AB and AD, I just have, say, a downward force here. Say I have force of a force of, I don't know, um, 10 kips. Well, look what happens now when I do a, when I do a, when I apply equations of equilibrium. Let's say I have this is at an angle theta, or let's first look at my free body diagram if I want to do this right. Uh, the free body diagram won't be too bad. I would have FAB, FAD, FAC, and the 10 kip load. And this would be at some angle theta. All right, so if I do a summation of forces in the y direction, in this case, I would have FAC uh, times the cosine of theta times the cosine of theta, or sorry, sine of theta, Sokotoa. Then minus 10 kips, and this would equal zero. And I, I suppose FAC would then be equal to 10 kips divided by whatever the sine of theta is. So I could actually calculate the member force, but it would not be a zero force member condition. It would not be a zero force member. So this would not be a zero force member. Now, another interesting condition that is similar to this is if you have two sets of collinear members. So again, I just like to include this because this is a common source of confusion uh, for students first taking statics and sometimes even structural analysis. Uh, sometimes they get hung up on the, uh, well, they remember the part of having the two collinear members and the one member that is not collinear, but they'll forget the crucial thing, the crucial item, that there can be no other non-collinear force on that joint. And they'll miss this and see, oh, well, I just have three members and ignore the force. No, they'll, they'll just say, oh, three members, two of, two of them collinear, uh, so therefore this is a zero force member. No, we have to go back to the basic definition. And I know this is quite complex or quite uh, quite long, and but every single one of those statements is key. So if you're going to have a, a set of collinear, if you're going to have a zero force member, uh, you have to have uh, a set of collinear members, one uh, other collinear member, and really nothing else at the joint. Yes, you can get away with a co with a uh, force that is also in line with these members, but uh, that rarely occurs. So usually I just focus on. Usually I'll just tell people or tell students. Uh, you can have two collinear members, one other member, and that's it. But technically, you can get away with a co another collinear member, another, another collinear force, but that does rarely occur. Now, one similar condition to this that is uh, kind of interesting, it's related, is if you have two sets of collinear members at a joint. This will not produce a uh, collinear member or a zero force member, but it will produce two sets of identical forces. Oh, and I should probably mention this is a key thing of a key application of zero force members. I should probably go back and mention this. Uh, here, look what happens if we get if, if uh, FAD is equal to zero. If negative FAB, we would then be left with negative FAB plus FAC is equal to zero, and therefore FAC is equal to FAB. So that's another interesting application of this. If you have a, a zero force member at a joint, and or if you have a member that has zero force uh, in it at the uh, at this joint, then because FAB and FAC are in line with each other, 
uh, they must be carrying equal loads. So basically at a true zero force member, your classic zero force member joint, you're going to have a member with zero force and then two members that are carrying equal and opposite loading. Uh, so basically if this, has a, if this has a tension force of five kips, then this one will also have a tension force of five kips. But related to this is if you have a, a two sets of collinear members at a joint. So for example, let's say you have something like this. Uh, let's say you have member, uh, let's do something like A, B, C, D, and E. So five joints, and two of them, basically they're going to be in equal, they're going to be in pairs, or collinear pairs. They'll be in collinear pairs. Uh, if I can, this thing just wants to jump ahead today. So they're in collinear pairs. Like this. And so, uh, again, AB is in the same line as BC, and uh, BD is in the same line as BE. Well, now if we do a summation of forces in the, in the uh, y direction, uh, let's go. Let's see what happens when you do this. Well, actually, I should probably draw the uh, free body diagram of joint B first. So, um, and let's say this is at some angle theta. Now look what happens when I draw out the free body diagram, and then we'll work through the. Let's consider the free body diagram, and then we'll work through the equations of equilibrium. So we'll have FAB and FBC. We'll have FBD and FBE. And this will be at some angle theta. So if I do a summation of forces in the y direction, I will have FBE, and of course if this is theta by a basic geometry, that is also theta. So FBE times the sine of theta minus FBE also times the sine of theta. But neither FAB or FBC will have any y component. And the theta, the sine of theta will cancel out. And I will, oh, that shouldn't say FBE, sorry, that should say FBD. FBD times the sine of theta. And so therefore, I will get that FBE is equal to FBD. These two forces or the, uh, will be equal and opposite. These two members will be carrying equal and opposite forces. And then if I do the same, then if I do a summation of forces in the horizontal direction, uh, if I do a summation of forces in the x direction, maybe I'll do it down here to give myself a little more room. I will have negative FAB uh, minus FBD times the cosine of theta uh, plus FBC uh, plus uh, FBD, uh, FBE times the cosine of theta. However, oh, and all this is equal to zero, so, and all of this is equal to zero, of course. Now, uh, however, FBE is equal to FBD. Therefore, this term here, because it's the same force and the same angle, this term here and this term here must cancel out. And so I'm left with negative FAB plus FBC is equal to zero, or FAB is equal to FBC. So basically what we end up with is a, a joint that has essentially two forces uh, or two force pairs going in. We basically have, oh, we could call this anything we wanted to, but basically we have F1, F1, and F2, and F2. So if you have basic, if you have two sets of collinear members, they'll be uh, carrying equal and opposite forces. They basically the the joint bis, bis, uh, the joint uh, cannot talk right now. The joint basically just ends up carrying the force through the member, or the, or the joint just ba basically ends up carrying the member uh, forces through itself without redistributing them at all. They just travel in a straight line through the joint. Next, I'd like to illustrate the idea of cascading zero-force members. 
And this is really cool. This is one of the coolest things I, th I like about Zero Force members. Uh, cascading Zero Force members. Now, this is not literally a dynamic process where uh, multiple things are moving around or something like that. Uh, when I use the term cascade, I'm talking only about uh, the analysis. Uh, this is just an analysis tool or a, a process or a process of analysis. And the name is a little bit more dramatic than what actually happens, but I always thought it was kind of cool. So let's draw out a truss. And again, in case it's not, uh, it's not obvious, when I'm drawing these out, because I'm talking about trusses, it's just kind of implied uh, that all of the joints are pin joints. Uh, so again, I don't, I, for, especially for a truss that's this, this large, I don't necessarily want to draw out all of the circular joints. So uh, unless otherwise stated, the uh, truss is, um, all of the joints in the truss are going to be uh, uh, pin joints. So let's say I had a truss like this, and uh, maybe I could do something like this. Oh, maybe something like this. Let's just draw out a whole bunch of joints here. Now I'm not gonna worry about drawing out all the dimensions because those aren't important to this particular problem. Let's just draw out a, um, not directly symmetric, but pseudo-symmetric truss, uh, truss here. And uh, let's say there is a force of, I don't know, uh, 50 kilonewtons applied to the top of this. Just some force, uh, some relatively large force applied to the top of this. Now, uh, let's look what happens. Uh, let's see if we can find any zero force members in this truss. Now, I could give us dimensions and everything else and angles and all that kind of stuff, but the nice thing about zero force members is that, uh, or at least for analyzing them, is we really don't need to know the exact geometry as long as we can, inf uh, can assume that things that appear collinear are. So, uh, basically, given this, find the zero force members in the truss. Uh, the zero force members in the truss. So I'm going to be looking for, uh, basically I'm going to be looking for uh, members that meet the zero force condition on one of their ends. And the big thing to look for is going to be where you have collinear members, so like a collinear member like a set of collinear members coming together at a joint with some other member coming into that joint that is not collinear. And uh, so take a look at that truss and see if there are uh, there's anything that pops out at you. Now this is definitely not uh, symmetric, even pseudo-symmetric, because clearly we have a joint here and a joint here that don't match up at all, and that's fine. It wasn't meant to be symmetric. Well, uh, so take a look at that and see if you can spot any zero force members. Uh, something that looks kind of like this. Okay, well, um, in case it's not popping out at you, the first things that pop out at me are this joint here and this joint here. With both of these, we have a set of collinear members this member here and this member here that uh, are collinear and there's a third member coming into this. So therefore, uh, maybe I don't have I don't have too many things on here, so I'm just going to start crossing out members that we determine are zero force. So we know from that this joint here is zero, uh, is uh, meets the condition and this joint here meets that condition because again, we have a collinear member set of collinear members here, a third member coming into it and no other force is applied to that joint. So this member must be carrying no load. It's carrying no load, so I'm just going to go ahead and cross it out. And the same thing here. This member, uh, because at this joint here, uh, again, you have two collinear members and a third coming into it with no other forces applied. Also, we remember from our previous discussion that it doesn't matter what's going on on this end. Uh, this end here uh, demands that this member carry zero load. It initially doesn't meet the zero force condition via uh, this joint here because we have uh, four members here, but it does on this end. And because a truss member can only carry a single force, uh, this end basically guarantees that the truss, uh, that particular member carries zero load. So therefore the entire thing must have zero load. So are we done? Well, actually, no. If, if, uh, trust, if zero force members and trusses couldn't cascade, we would be, but we're far from it. 
because now that this uh, member here is carrying zero force, it's basically like that member doesn't exist in terms of balance of forces. So if I look at equilibrium in this joint, I now have uh, one member here that is carrying, uh, that is uh, now basically meeting the zero force member condition because when this uh, member is fixed at zero load, uh, it is effectively like it doesn't exist. So imagine in your mind, or maybe on your screen, cover up this member with your thumb or something. And if you look at it, then you can then you can see that this member is meeting the zero force condition. It is going to have, uh, a, again, meeting the zero force condition at this joint. Because it has, uh, because if this member weren't here, and it basically isn't because it's carrying zero force, you have a set of two, two collinear members, and this member can the, and is not collinear with them, and there are no other forces present, that thus this force, or this member, must be a zero force member. So I can then conclude that this is also a zero force member. Then I can go over here and look at this member over here. And because this member is now basically out of the picture because it's a zero force member, if I look at this joint, uh, this member and this member are collinear, and this one is not. And it's the only member coming into that joint, again, because this member is now out of the picture. So this one must be a zero force member. All right, let's go to this joint here. With this one out of the picture, um, <laughs> with this one out of the picture, so you can kind of see this is where, you can kind of see this is where things are getting a little bit ridiculous. With this, uh, at this joint, with this member out of the picture carrying zero load, this member is now a zero force member because the, you now have a set of two members, this one and this one, with a third one coming into it and nothing else present. Again, this member is basically out of the picture. It's basically not present because it's carrying zero load. Then I could look at this joint here, and by the same logic, this member is now carrying a zero load. It's now a zero force member. And then at this joint, uh, we have this member and this member, which are collinear. And this member is no longer effectively there because its member force is zero, which means that this member force is also zero. So we have yet another zero force member. And finally, in the most ridiculous case, we have this joint here, which both this member here and this member here are zero force members. And now we have a collinear member here and a collinear member here. And with nothing else to resist the load in this one in the y direction, this member must be a zero force member. So you can see where this gets a little bit silly, but it's actually, or, or it seems a little bit silly, but it's actually entirely consistent with the laws of statics. So I always thought this is one of the cool ideas of zero force members, or one of the more interesting things in trust analysis. So uh, member zero, the zero force member condition can cascade through a truss. Uh, can cascade through a truss. Rendering many or fixing many of the members as zero force, at zero force or zero load. Uh, many of the members at zero force. Now, so that's the basic idea of that is the basic idea of zero force members, and we could maybe look at some other examples, but they're all going to basically follow the same idea. So if I had a, oh, let's draw something else out. Maybe I could draw something like this, and they're not always going to to uh, cascade to such a ridiculous degree. Let's say you had something like this. This would be a really weird way to build a truss, but let's go ahead and find go let's go ahead and find all of the zero force members. Let's say there's a force P here. Well, let's take a look. So uh, first, this member here is gonna be a zero force member by this joint here. So that one kind of goes away. Then this member here is a zero force member because of this joint here. So that's out of the picture. 
this member here is a zero force member because of this joint here. Um, this member here is a zero force member because of this joint here. And now with this one out of the picture, this member here is now a zero force member because of this joint here. But notice we're still left with a large uh, structural system or a sufficiently rigid structural system because if you uh, we cannot say this member is zero force or this member is zero force because this member and this member are not collinear and this member and this member are not collinear. So, and if you look at what remains of the, of the truss, we still have a simple truss that still has its strong triangular shape. So um, it shouldn't surprise us that that particular truss collapses down to something with simple triangular forms. So the final thing I like to mention in discussing zero force members is uh, why would you build them in a truss? Why would you bother building a truss with, uh, with members that carry zero load? Uh, trusses with zero force members. Isn't that just wasted material? Isn't that wasted construction time? Isn't that wasted uh, connections? Isn't that wasted weight? All that kind of thing. Why would you bother building something if you know, according to your analysis, um, that it's not going to carry any load. Isn't that just the height of insanity? Why in the world would you build something that's not going to carry any load? It would be at, at first glance it might think it might, it might be like imagine if I built my house uh, let's say I built something like this. Let's say I built an ordinary house uh, and I'm, this is going to be a poorly drawn house at best. Let's say I just built an ordinary house uh, with a regular wooden frame and everything else, but for some reason, not carrying any load, I build a gigantic, huge concrete column in it. Just a big, you know, five foot wide, you know, incredibly strong, 20 foot tall or 30 foot tall concrete column, you know, the kind of thing that would hold up a bridge pier or something. I mean, why in the world would, and, and just for fun, I don't even attach it to anything in the house, like the main roof system or something. It's just sticking up right through the roof, not really doing anything except taking up space. Why in the world would I do that? What's the, what kind of insane person would build a house like that with a, you know, a wooden frame but with a giant uh, bridge pier just sitting in the middle of it? Well, I suppose maybe a crazy structural engineer who really just liked looking at concrete columns would build that, but uh, otherwise nobody would build something like that because it wouldn't serve any practical purpose. It would drastically increase the cost of the house without providing any utility. So now at first you might think, isn't the truss the same as that crazy concrete column house? Well, the truth is no. So let's go back to the example um, of the truss, of that kind of truss with the uh, a bunch of zero force members in it. Um, or actually, let's look at this here. Maybe I'll put it here. Something like this. Something like this and something like this. Now, so if I draw it out like I'd had before, or with the loads I had before, in this case, yes, all of the interior members end up carrying zero load, and all of the mem all of the force from load P ends up being distributed if these are the, let's say you have the reaction forces here and here, uh, the support forces here and here on both ends, all of the load P ends up being distributed down through the top cord here and the top cord here. So you basically would have a tension member, or sorry, a compression member, a compression member and a single tension member, and all of these interior uh, members would carry zero load. But what happens if I have different loads? Oop, let me, I accidentally erased my top cord. Let me put that back. Uh, don't, I try not to erase my trusses. It's usually bad for business. So uh, what happens though, if the load, if I have a load here, um, or actually better yet, what happens if I applied a, a downward load here and a downward load here? Now, in that case, uh, this member is no longer a zero force member because there's now a load at that joint and the vertical, uh, uh, this will have a com vertical component. Or if I do a uh, more properly said, let's look at this joint here. If I uh, look at equilibrium on that joint, I would have a force here, a force here, a force here, and a force here. If I do a summation of forces, let's call that just, uh, I don't know, uh, five tips or something, and maybe this is force F, uh, AB. 
that's five kips, and that's some angle theta. Uh, so my forces in the y direction, I would have FAB times the sine of theta minus five kips equals zero. So I now have a force that I need to resist, and FAB is no longer equal to zero. So if I change the loadings on the truss, then um, those members will no longer be zero force. Zero force members are not purely a, a product of geometry. When we looked at determinacy and stability, uh, determinacy is, is independent of loads. Uh, when we said whether a truss was statically determinate, we didn't care what kind of loads were on the truss. It was purely a, pr a product of geometry. Uh, independent of geometry, or sorry, of loads. But zero force condition, the zero force de condition is entirely dependent on the loads present. is entirely dependent on the loads applied. On the loads applied. And this fundamentally is why you would build a truss with uh, members that you would otherwise, uh, that your first analysis might indicate would have zero load. And in case it's not clear, the main reason, the first reason I want to talk about is one, we do not design structures to carry a single load type. We design structures to carry multiple loads. So for example, if this is a major bridge truss, uh, how we design highway bridges, for example, is, or think about how bridges are actually loaded in the real world. Uh, the design case for a, or the, what I mean by the design case, the heaviest load that a bridge is usually designed for is usually something like a, uh, oh, a very, very, very heavily loaded uh, semi-truck, a big, uh, you know, big rig, uh, you know, multi-axle uh, shipping truck. And so, you know, loaded up to the weight limits of the bridge or the rated load limits or whatever that might be, it's think of the biggest, heaviest semi that you would see somebody driving. That's basically the maximum load case a, a bridge is, is usually designed for. But how are, how are semis actually driven? Uh, you know, we don't uh, load a bridge up by, imagine something crazy, like we don't load a bridge up by, you know, taking the semi, uh, we don't lift the semi up on a, tr uh, on via a crane, you know, slowly lower it onto one particular location on the bridge, and then lift it back up again. No, that's not how. That's that's not, of course, not how bridges work. We don't apply the the load from the semi truck is not applied to one location on the bridge. Uh, that bridge needs to be designed to carry the the load of that semi truck anywhere along the length of it. So, that semi truck needs to be able to drive from one end of the bridge to the other, not overloading the tr uh, the truss at any point, no matter where it is. Um, because again, the truck needs to be able to drive from one end to the other, and even if it can now, even if the bridge is going to be fine with the semi truck here, uh, but it's going to but if, that that's fine. But it, but let's say it's it, the bridge is fine with the truck here. Well, if the bridge is going to collapse when the truck is over here, that bridge is not a very good bridge. I, I don't want to be on a bridge that's uh, you know strong enough to withstand a truck here and just fine. But if it, the bridge, if the truck ever goes over here, the entire bridge is going to collapse. That is not a properly designed bridge. We need we design uh, bridges and structures in general to support a, a, an entire variety of loads. Also, you got to consider things like wind. Uh, wind is going to come from any can come from any direction, and so uh, because wind can come from any direction, it wouldn't no matter what kind of now, uh, depending on the direction the wind is applied, you are going to get different types of uh, loadings on your different given members. Now, this is again the beyond the scope of the course. We don't teach you detailed wind design, although in your project for the semester we are looking at a basic structural design that I'll elaborate on later. But uh, the key thing to keep in mind is that when we look at uh, trusses in uh, our basic structural analysis we do in this course, I just say, or you're just told, here is a truss with a certain load applied to it, but in re and you have to calculate the amount of force in different members. But in reality, in real design, in real structures, we look at a whole bunch of different uh, what are called load cases. We say, okay, well, what if the, load, the wind is coming from this direction? What if the wind is coming from this direction? What if there are... 
uh, different combinations of vehicles on this bridge, whatever it might be. And we design a real structure for dozens, perhaps hundreds, of, hundreds of different load types. And so, even though you may, uh, even though I can design a, or draw a truss that will have zero force for this particular loading, for other loadings, the, me the those members will not carry zero load. So. Uh, they might be carrying zero load for this particular loading, but if we start loading the truss up with other uh, very possible loadings, the members will not carry zero load. And that's one case. That's one major case why, where we, or one major reason why we would not, we would maybe build a truss with zero force members in it, uh, or at least for a given analysis. But two, another main, and that's probably the main reason. Uh, the other one, which uh, may be a bit beyond the scope of this course, is buckling. Our truss members carry both tension and compression load, and these members here would be acting as columns. They'd be carrying very large compression loading. And I know we've discussed this briefly before, but columns uh, usually do not fail in actual crushing. They tend to fail in buckling. Uh, if you take like a, imagine taking a drinking straw and, and pushing down on either ends, that's not going to fail by, you know, crushing. In other words, the column isn't going to end up scrunched down like this, completely completely crushed. That's a crushing load. No, if you try to compress a drinking straw, it's going to buckle out one side or another. If you brace the metal, like put your thumb, take a drinking straw and put your thumbs on either end while holding it against a table, what you'll find is that it tends to buckle then. Um, oop, that, that's the original column shape. If you apply a compression loading like this, what it tends to do is buckle like that in kind of an S shape. Uh, again, it tends not to just flatten out and collapse under the load. It tends to buckle in a geometric failure. And uh, now this may be something you haven't learned yet. You may have seen this in a physics class. Sometimes physics courses do cover this briefly. But uh, Euler column buckling is the classic example. But uh, columns fail in buckling. And the buckling load, uh, the force required to buckle, uh, required to buckle a column, uh, required to buckle a column, uh, a column, at least in terms of simple Euler column buckling, but that's all you need to worry about for this. The force is proportional to the unbraced length squared. I would call this the unbraced length. So if you double, uh, actually, sorry, uh, inversely proportional, one over L squared. So if you double the unbraced length, you increase the force, um, basically the force that it can take, you decrease it to one quarter of what it was. If you double the unbraced length, you increase, you uh, decrease the, the load it can carry by a factor of four. So if previously it could withstand 10 kips of load, um, when you double the unbraced braced length, it can now only carry 2.5 kips of load. So it's highly dependent on the length of the column. So even if this was the only load this truss ever had to carry, uh, if you had to have these very, very long unbraced compression members, uh, these uh, these uh, it would probably these columns would probably buckle uh, just under this load. They wouldn't be able to withstand it. Or these columns would have to be mon or, or these truss members would have to be monstrously thick, really ridiculously strong sections. So your truss connect even if this was the only load uh, for some crazy reason, even if this was the only load this bridge uh, this truss ever had to carry, it would often still be beneficial to have these interior members, j if nothing else, just to provide buckling on these very large uh, compression members. Anyway, uh, that's probably a bit beyond the scope of the course. You should probably focus on this one here, and really this entire thing is just a bit of theory. Uh, for uh, my students in my current statics class, I don't expect you to really be uh, aware of the deep theory of this, but it would be nice, but I do want you to be aware of what a zero force member is and to be able to identify them for a given uh, set of truss loadings. All right, that'll do it for this part, uh, part one of the lecture. I just wanted to cover uh, zero force members and provide a uh, decent and in-depth discussion on uh, zero force members and, and how they come about. All right, that'll do it for now. Thank you uh, for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this. Hope you learned a few things. We'll be back soon for part two, where we look at and start going into um, and analyzing trusses by the method of sections. All right, that'll, that's the, uh, Tanya Laird here signing off. I will see you all soon for part two. And as always, thank you.